Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. the GSMC Health and Wellness Podcast, brought to you by GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Stacey, and for those of you who may not know, I also host the GSMC Movie Podcast, and one of my, it's not normally my favorite genre of movies, but it's my favorite genre lately, for some reason, is sort of futuristic and seeing all the different things that filmmakers imagine will have in the future, the way the future will be set up. So you'll see, you know, along with self-driving cars and uh, implanted technological devices, you'll also see like, oh, hey, you know, uh, certain political changes or whatever. Like one of the really interesting things was a few years ago when it was the 30th anniversary of Back to the Future and Back to the Future 2, which was set in 2015, people went and looked at the way 2015 was portrayed in Back to the Future 2, and how did that compare to the real Back to the Future, and what we do have and what we don't have, and why do we still not have flying cars? I'm so upset. But one of the things I always found so interesting in futuristic movies and television shows was sort of food. So in Back to the Future 2, there's a pizza that is, I think it's, and it's a brand name pizza, it's either Domino's or Pizza Hut or something, But you put it in like a, I think it's called a rehydrator. And so originally it's the size of like a coaster, but then you rehydrate it for like 10 seconds and it becomes a full size pizza, which was of course just movie magic. But the idea that somehow our food would be that way, where it would be like this small little thing and that becomes a full pizza or full meal, that actually seems to come up quite a bit. And I'm still very upset along with not having flying cars that we don't yet have like a meal a meal in a pill or even like a meal in a piece of gum the way we did in Willy Wonka I'm just like I feel I feel lied to I feel cheated wasn't I supposed to have all these things that would make it so much easier and also mean I don't have to cook and we're still not there yet and I still can't cook so all sorts of terrible things are happening with my food eating adventures but that idea that oh we can get everything in a pill that's very popular in health and wellness. You always sort of hear about this new product or that new product, which is supposed to be sort of a, a catch-all silver bullet in a pill that will solve all your problems. Usually these are for things like weight loss, you know, oh, this pill will cause you to lose however many pounds in a probably not healthy short amount of time. And then of course, more often than not, those don't really seem to work that well. And for me, especially one of the things that I struggle with health and wellness wise is sugar, which I've talked a bit about on this podcast. I have a bit of a sweet tooth. And also since I don't like to cook, so many of the things that I eat are just processed and they're in packages. And you can almost bet, just a safe bet, that if something comes in some sort of packaging, that it probably at least has sugar in it, even if it's not considered a quote unquote sweet thing to eat. So I would love it if, you know, there was a way for me to not want sugar because I've tried several times to like cut out sugar and even just limiting that to cutting out like sugary drinks, not drinking. I'm actually pretty okay with not drinking soda. I can do not soda, but then things that I can sort of like lie to myself and be like, oh, well, this is kind of healthy because it has, you know, B vitamins and electrolytes, things like Powerade and things like vitamin water. Those are hard, especially for meals. 
like a meal with plain water just often feels almost, I won't say torturous, but it's just like, this is so not a good meal because I'm drinking plain water. It's like, I want something else. But at the same time, I obviously don't want soda. So aha, the healthy sugary thing, that'll do it. It's healthy, but also sweet and it tastes good. So my sugar receptors are all very happy. And I'm like, why couldn't I just be And I know there are some people out there, though they always completely fill me off, who just are like, nah, I don't really care for sweet things. And I'm just like, in the same way for people who like don't like chocolate, not are allergic to chocolate, just don't like chocolate. I'm just like, what? How? What? Is that even possible? Well, it turns out, yes, especially for the sugar thing, and that pharmaceuticals are trying to make this into a drug, in which case, the moment it is FDA approved, which may take a long, long time, unfortunately, I would so be like first in line at the pharmacy, be like, give me, give me, give me, give me. What this thing that makes me not want sugary things, please. So this is coming from a thing called essential fructose, fructosuria. And fructo, essential fructosuria is actually a genetic mutation. So that people who have this lack the primary enzyme needed to metabolize fructose. So these people essentially, they don't metabolize sugars the way most people do. And so they have very, very little risk of obesity, type two diabetes, serious liver ailments, all those things that come with way too much sugar consumption. They even, it's so weird. They don't, they don't metabolize it the same way. So they don't get like that sugar kickback that we all like that then makes us want more sugar. But because they don't metabolize it the same way as we do, they actually can have, tend to have high blood sugar levels, but it doesn't affect them so much. It's, it's very strange. And the science for it, if you type in essential fructosoria, so much of what comes up for it is just medical journal articles and stuff. It's very science it was hard to find a lot of this in like layman's terms but so in- essentially essential fructosuria people and this is like super super rare it's very hard to find people with this partly because it's asymptomatic they don't really show symptoms and so doctors only kind of find out that they have it usually when they're like testing for some other medical reason but this is somewhere around maybe every one in 130,000 people. And that number might be a little higher, but again, because they're asymptomatic, we really can't tell. Like there are probably a number of people who have essential fructosuria and just because they've never shown any symptoms and have never needed anything to test for it that would show it up, are just like, oh, we have no clue. They just, you know, they tend to be very thin and healthy. And so they're, you know, not coming in for medical tests that would also show this for other reasons. And so it's just like, oh, that's just a wonderfully healthy, fit person. Darn it, how do you do that so naturally? So they actually don't really have too much of a problem. Like fructose is something our body does need, which is why we tend to have that sweet taste. We want that sweet thing because it's actually very hard to find in nature and we don't make it ourselves. So, you know, before we had the ability to process the heck out of sugar, this would lead us to things like fruit, which in their natural form also generally have a lot of fiber that goes with that sugar. So it's, you know, the good and the bad. And then we've processed the heck out of it. So we can just get the sugar by itself without any of the good stuff that would also sort of moderate it. But people with essential fructosoria, save for an aversion to sweets, don't really have any ill consequences because of this genetic mutation. And I'm just like, why, why did I not have this really, really rare genetic mutation? You know, when I was born, this would have saved me so much like hassle and self-esteem problems and just not having to deal with the sugar issue. Although I was actually pretty good, like dental wise, I didn't have a cavity till I was 18. So, and then I went off to college and was on my own. And yeah, all the wonderful health things that come along with college. Uh, we're <laughs> While we're thinking of that, we're actually going to take a short break. Stay tuned.
Still on the search of that one true love? On the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well, listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast. Your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships. Welcome back to the GSMC Health and Wellness Podcast, where today we are talking about essential fructosoria, which is currently being studied by certain pharmaceutical companies. I know Pfizer, the big one, Pfizer is sort of the main one looking to somehow turn essential fructosoria into some sort of drug. But there are others, both, you know, drug companies, but also just medical researchers who are looking at this and how to take this from being a genetic mutation into something that people who don't have this mutation can also benefit from. But again, what I really like about this is the fact that it essentially makes you not want sugar, which is something I really struggle with. And it's something I should really, you know, fix as soon as possible because consuming too much fructose is associated with things like liver disease and type two diabetes and is usually responsible for a condition called fatty liver, which can lead to NASH. And NASH is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. All the medical words today. So NASH, it, this brings out things like inflammation, scarring, metabolic changes on the liver. Up to about 12% of Americans are estimated to have NASH. And if we could somehow turn essential fructosoria into a drug, this would mean that inhabit, uh, excuse me, inhibiting metabolism by the fructose enzyme fructokinase would uh, then be in people who don't also have this uh, mutation. And inhabiting this enzyme, uh, inhibiting, I do not know why I want to keep saying inhabiting. I don't want to inhabit this enzyme. I want to probably get rid of it. But inhibiting it has been shown to reduce the risk of developing those diseases I mentioned earlier, fatty liver disease, diabetes, etc. People with essential fructosuria just generally don't have fructokinase. So they especially don't inhabit it, but I also don't want to inhabit it. And I clearly evidently don't want it too much because then I wouldn't want sugar. So fructose is also associated with weight gain and increases the risk factors of metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome, I feel, has come up a couple of times on this podcast, but without really going into what the heck is metabolic syndrome? What are you talking about? That's just a term I feel you could have made up anywhere. Well, yes, it's a real thing, but it's actually technically a cluster of things. And so they just put it together in this one term, metabolic syndrome, to talk about all these sort of terrible health things together. So metabolic syndrome is a cluster of conditions that occur together and increase risk of heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. These conditions include increased blood pressure, high blood sugar, excess body fat around the waist, and abnormal cholesterol or triglyceride levels. So those all sound really just icky. Metabolic syndrome is closely linked to overweightness or obesity, and it's also linked to insulin insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is where the cells don't respond as they normally should to insulin. And so glucose can't actually enter the cells because it's not responding to the insulin the way it's supposed to. It just keeps pumping out this insulin. It's like, but yeah, but no. So most of the disorders associated with metabolic syndrome actually have no symptoms themselves. But the closest sign, the easiest sign for people to spot, I should say, is a large waist circumference. So I believe for women, it's you shouldn't have a waist circumference of greater than, I want to say 35 inches, and for men, it's 40 inches. Um, but if you're, if you're getting that, that doesn't necessarily mean you have metabolic syndrome, but that's just sort of the clearest 
sign of it since most of these things don't have symptoms. There are a number of things that can actually increase your chance of having metabolic syndrome. So this is your age. As your age goes up, your risk goes up. Um, For some odd reason, this also seems somewhat correlated with race. So in the U.S., They say that Mexican-Americans actually appear to be at the greatest risk of developing metabolic syndrome. Um, Obesity is obviously a great risk factor. Uh, Diabetes, you're more likely to have metabolic syndrome if you had either diabetes during pregnancy, which is gestational diabetes, or if you have a family history of type 2 diabetes. But your risk of metabolic syndrome can also be high if you've had things like cardiovascular disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or polycystic ovary syndrome. So a number of things there. But having metabolic syndrome in this sort of catch-22 increases your risk of developing diabetes and cardiovascular disease. You're at a higher risk if you have those, and if you have it, you increase your risk of getting those. And it's just like, so if ever I got onto an unhealthy cycle, there's no escape Great. Awesome. I'm, I'm kind I may be screwed. Um, metabolic syndrome is a major problem. It affects nearly a quarter of the adult population. I did see one chart where it was like under essentially children under the age of majority were like, eh, this small amount. And then everyone, no matter what the age range above 18, it was just like, yeah, a big amount, a big amount, a big amount, roughly a quarter. That's not anything to sneeze at, you know, just thinking of the U.S., which is hundreds of millions of people. I won't even try and do the math there, but that's more than, you know, 50 million. Um, if you know you have at least one of those components of metabolic syndrome, you should ask your doctor whether you need testing for the other components of the syndrome. Um, to diagnose the syndrome, your doctor will then have to perform several different tests. And the results of the test will be looked to see if you have three or more signs of the disorder. Abnormal, uh, excuse me, abnormalities noted on three or more of the tests then indicate the presence of metabolic syndrome. So your doctor will be checking things like waist circumference. Again, this is a very easy sign, the, perhaps the easiest. And clearly, one you don't even necessarily need your doctor to check for. You can just measure your own waist. Uh, fasting blood triglycerides, your cholesterol levels, your blood pressure, and your fasting glucose level. So part of why I'm really interested in whether or not essential fructose aurea becomes a drug is because we know, you know, things about like alcohol and how alcohol and too much uh, drinking of alcohol can really hurt your liver. But sugar actually does that quite a bit, too. I remember when I was reading a thing about sugar, they were talking about comparing a beer belly to a soda belly because it acts in a number of similar ways. And so even though, you know, we know about beer bellies, you don't normally expect to see that, you know, and people certainly, hopefully not, and people below drinking age. But you can easily see soda bellies because soda is a lot of sugar. And there are some people who drink certainly way more sugar, but we don't think of it as being as destructive, I guess. We certainly don't have a drinking age for soda, and I don't know that, I don't even know if they could have like a roadside test for how much sugar you've imbibed. Have you been drinking soda tonight, sir? Like, that would be very difficult. We just, A, normally don't think of it that way, but B, to have the medical ability to test for it in the same way we can with alcohol, which clearly affects your abilities, would be a bit difficult, but they both do still have these really negative health effects, especially on the liver, because it's processing through the same way, because a lot of alcohol does actually have sugar in it, and there's a whole science, chemistry, this has so many, you know, atoms of this element with these bonds that I won't go into because I kind of disliked chemistry both in high school and college just and I remember it was my first semester and I took a four-hour chemistry lab at like eight in the morning I was just like 
I'm not sure I like this whole college thing. If this is what it's going to be like, four hours of chemistry at eight in the morning, why? But yeah, I won't go into that. The science is a bit over my head. Chemistry was not my favorite thing. Point being, they're similar enough to the point that we should be worried about excess sugar intake. And so I'm very excited if they could possibly create essential fructose aurea into a drug to sort of, you know, not not want that so much. I don't know that I, I don't drink, so I don't know if there is a drug that they do to like sort of in the same way you have like Nicorette gum and the nicotine patches to help you quit smoking to do that for qu- quitting alcohol. But this would be that, I guess, essentially somewhat similar for sugar. So we're going to take another short break. Stay tuned. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Health and Wellness Podcast. As I mentioned earlier, there is not currently a drug that essentially, essentially, excuse me, that, you know, recreates the effects that people with essential fructose aurea naturally have within them. It's currently being worked on. I think it's still in like the very early stages of clinical testing. I don't fully understand how clinical testing works, but it's certainly, you know, it doesn't seem anytime like this year that we're possibly going to have, you know, an FDA approved version. Though again, I could be wrong. I don't fully understand drug testing, but it sounded like from what I read about it, even Pfizer, which is this huge, huge pharmaceutical company is still, you know, in the more beginning stages towards making this into a drug. And part of that is the problem of just even finding people to study with this, to study what their body is doing and why it's doing it that way. Since again, This is a one in 130,000 chance or so. And even then, those people are asymptomatic. So it's not like, oh, we can tell you have it. You don't know you have it often until you come in for some other sort of medical testing. So even finding people to study, like in the article I read, I think they said the last person with essential fructose aurea in a medical study was like the late 90s, like 98 or something. So it's been that long since even a medical article has had a study on this, it would be a while, certainly, to get an FDA-approved drug. But if, if it was able to become a drug, the idea is that it would be taken probably once a day, and it might be even more so aimed at people with NASH or people in danger of NASH, even so, (laughs) more so probably, than people like me who just, you know, want to find a way to stop eating sugar so much. Certainly, if you're fighting a disease more so than like, oh, this is a health slash diet pill, you would get, you know, hey, this can actually be offered in a prescription. And therefore, we have all the business that comes with that versus diet pills that could just regularly go on the the grocery shelves. Not so much. But if it works, it would be taken once a day to prevent the buildup of fat cells in the liver. And I can understand why several drug companies would be working on this, even beyond the, we've all now transitioned to the, oh, maybe we should cut down on our sugar 
in the health thing. It used to be, you know, a few decades ago, it was fat. We should all cut out fat. And now more and more, we're getting to, wait, there's a lot of sugar in things and they're under a lot of different names. So I'm eating way more sugar than I thought I was. This might actually be bad. And this is evidently really a new idea in the medical field that it was only in the past 10, 15 years, I think, like end of the first decade of the 2000s, that doctors were actually convinced by research that, ah, yes, no sugar does cause these health problems. We didn't think it did, but oh, wow, it does. The Nash drug market is expected to be worth about $40 billion by 2025. And that's, again, that's seven years from now when I'm recording this to be worth $40 billion. I'm not sure what the Nash drug market is now, but considering the fact that I never even heard of Nash and certainly that, you know, the obesity epidemic just seems to keep growing and growing. And a huge part of that is now blamed on the ease which with people can get really unhealthy food, including sugar, including a lot of processed foods that have hidden sugar. Certainly that's probably going to continue to grow very quickly. So I can see why drug companies would definitely want to, you know, be the first to come out with a, a product that helps fight this. I can also see why this might be wishful thinking for a while, gosh darn it, because it's super <laughs> difficult to even find someone to study. And then the whole process of medical studies always takes a long time, you know, usually years for many things. And certainly because this is not just a drug product by itself, they're attempting to recreate a genetic mutation. You certainly want them to be thorough in this before it gets approval and can go out to the general public because obviously we don't have that, you know. Most people do not have this genetic mutation. If you're trying to recreate a mutation, you're not sure how that'll respond in most people's bodies since they don't generally have it. You could be sort of creating a creating a bigger monster than the one you're trying to slay. So I'm excited if this could become a drug. I'm also cautious enough that I'll just, I'll wait impatiently because I'm not very good with patience. I will impatiently wait for the drug testing to come through to see which drug company comes out with it first. Will it be Pfizer? Will it be another big name? Will it be a smaller thing that you wouldn't have thought of but has somehow managed to, you know, eureka upon an interesting take on it and Therefore, go forward that where that other drug companies could not find. We'll see. We'll see if it does get approval or if this will be one of those things that isn't approved for many years, but then you have the whole, some people get around that, other people don't, and what the effect will be, not just on the general pub public, but if this was made, you know, generally available with at least like a prescription would this then have some sort of larger impact on the obesity and diabetes epidemic that we're currently struggling with? So a lot to see in the future. I'm very excited about this news, but it does seem like we'll have to wait, unfortunately. So in the meantime, I would like to thank you for listening to the GSMC Health and Wellness Podcast. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Health and Wellness Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.